thought coming in by He's on I that's see. him right there yeah I see Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to the East Hemphill Township Board of Supervisors meeting. Tonight's meeting has been advertised to be held in person and online using Zoom with login and call-in information posted on our website. If you're calling into the meeting, I'd like to encourage you to remain on the call, but to also go to the Township website by Googling East Hemphill Township and to log into our Zoom meeting following the instructions on our homepage. Tonight's video and audio is being recorded. For tonight's meeting, Robert's rules will still apply and the meeting will be run by a chairman who will be assisted by an employee managing the Zoom site. Everyone on Zoom will have their microphones muted in order for the audio to be clearly heard. During the meeting, both those present and online, only one person at a time speaks and they must be recognized by the chairman. Many speaking at the same time may combine with background noise makes meetings like this impossible to hear on Zoom. This rule will be strictly enforced. For people utilizing Zoom, you'll need to use the chat function to be recognized by the chairman. To be recognized with the chat function, you, will, you must be either a presenter who's on the agenda or a resident or business owner in East Enfield Township who wishes to comment on an agenda item where you must text your name and address. Your request to speak will then be passed on the staff for the chairman to be recognized. The steps to speak utilizing Zoom are simple. Request recognition by a chairman to speak via chat. Once recognized by a chairman, unmute your microphone. After receiving recognition, speak. When done speaking, mute your microphone. Any Zoom violations of any dimensions rules will be de deemed to be acting out of order and your microphone will be muted immediately without warning. Continued violations will result in you being electronically removed from the meeting. Robert's rules apply for those attending the meeting in person. All voting tonight will be done by roll call vote to ensure all votes are properly accounted for. Roll call will be conducted by a township manager. There will be no action taken on any non-agenda items of a non-emergency, non-urgent nature that arise during the meeting. All such items will be referred to staff and be handled at a later meeting. East Central Township's public comment rules will apply for all public comment. You must be a resident or business owner of the township to speak. You must identify yourself by name and address before speaking and sign the guest log for the meeting minute purposes or follow the chat procedure already discussed for Zoom and tenants. Comment is limited to three minutes and must be about the agenda item being discussed uh, with the exception of public comment at the end of the meeting for non-agenda items. No action will be taken in the public comment period for non-agenda items with all issues referred to staff. We thank you for your patience. And now we'll go to our first agenda item. Please rise for a moment of silence and the pledge. Now the pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Invisible with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. I think for the, the first order of business before we get into our agenda items, we actually do have five members present for tonight's meeting. Uh, Mr. Wigglesworth is actually participating in the meeting via Zoom. Uh, he is coming back from New York City as we speak. Uh, so there are five present in tonight's meeting. So with that, we will move on to our first agenda item, and that's the consent agenda. The purpose of the consent agenda is to approve routine items that usually require very little debate or discussion. So with that, I will open up the consent agenda. Uh, just a point of order. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have an item that we need to add to tonight's agenda? Yeah, we got that for number three. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yep. I didn't. Uh, Mr. Chairman and board, I would like... <laughs> If our chief fire official could explain for my benefit and possibly others, the role of the agency duty officer that he refers to in his report. He was Kotzmeyer, are you there? He was planning on attending. I don't know if he's on the call yet. I don't see him listed. Ms. Garber, could you, do you happen to know yourself? I, I'm here. Yeah, he's, on, he's on his cell phone. Can you hear him? Yes, we can you hear him, yes. Go ahead, John. The joint duty officer was essentially a, a program that was set up and written as sort of a kind of like a protocol set up. Uh, a little while ago, and essentially what it is, is kind of like a sharing from an incident management perspective. In other words, 
incidents as they escalate or larger incidents uh, from an incident management perspective may require several officers. Um, and this allows for kind of interagency or interdepartmental cooperation from department to department, as well as assisting in, you know, uh, duty officers or covering falls during days or evenings or whatever. And the idea is to consistently, and that way we're all kind of doing things across all departments the same way. Um, it really is to give some relief to some of the officers that have been doing this for quite a few years, um, you know, as well as, again, giving them time if, you know, if things come up in their life or they can't, you know, uh, cover a duty assignment or whatever. And, and then there's other folks that uh, other officers that are able to do that. But essentially, it's twofold. Um, we do provide training. We're providing training incident management uh, as well as we're also going to use this as a means to train some of our younger officers, some of our line officers, uh, so that as they, you know, progress throughout their, you know, kind of their careers in the volunteer service that, uh, you know, if they aspire to become a, a deputy chief or a chief officer, uh, they'll have the training as well. Okay. Well, thank you. And also, <clears throat> could you, do you know the origin of the 10% contribution by a fire station for a new piece of apparatus yes uh, essentially when i looked at options for financing for yeah. apparatus and and i, I kind of went down the lease purchase option that was kind of like one of the quotes or the quotes that they came up with it's the most common one that they see from fire departments that are that are utilizing um the the lease purchase option Again, there's other, it's a myriad of, of options that you can choose, but the 10% from, uh, from, the, from the organization or the 10% down was a typical thing. And that's what I listed on there, 10% down and then the remaining financed over a period of years through a lease, a lease purchase option. So it's somewhat of an industry standard, one might say. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. What, that's what they're saying. They typically see is they, these are finance. I mean, you can obviously. I mean, if, if more money can be put down, uh, but that's typically what they see: a ten percent down, and then the remainder is the lease option, the and, lease purchase. And your your statement indicated the municipalities would cover the ninety percent. That would be a goal. That would be a goal to assist the departments. Again, you know, with the officers, one of the single greatest expenses to the departments is apparatus right. and from a fire chief's perspective it's it's difficult all the time to figure out you know even over a period of years where that money is going to come from because the prices just continue to increase um even the pierce as i mentioned in the fire commission meeting uh in june there's going to be an increase it's a commodities increase based on the uh, you know materials and they're going to have to pass that on to the consumer and as such we're going to see a you know a price increase and and they just exponentially like any large piece of equipment like that and especially when you talk fire ems the price just goes up exponentially and uh so it's difficult and it's you know looking at a way to to help relieve that um somewhat um can can take a lot of pressure off of a fire chief for sure okay well thank you okay. mr chairman yes mr wigglesworth go ahead um I'd like to have a deeper discussion on what uh, Mr. Lefebvre brought up uh, later. Understood. Um, under the manager's report or forward um, working group reports. Okay, we can talk about that later in the Absolutely. meeting. Absolutely. Is, is that good, Mr. Wigglesworth? I think he's breaking up. Yes. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Yes. For, anything else for the consent agenda, guys? No, we're good. Okay, I'll entertain a motion to adopt the consent agenda as presented. So moved. Okay, motion for Mr. Bennett. Is there a second? Second. Second, Mr. Lefevre. Ms. Schweitzer, please pull the board. Mr. Weaver. Aye. Mr. Bennett. Aye. Mr. Lefevre. Aye. Mr. Wigglesworth. Aye. Mr. Russell. Aye. The ayes have it five nothing. Okay, next up, we have two items uh, to take action on to add to the agenda. Ms. Schweitzer, would you like to explain both of them, please? So we just recently 
received another request for uh, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation grant submittal. That grant submittal is due tomorrow. This second one is from the Little Conestoga Creek Foundation, which is affiliated with the Conestoga Greenway project that uh, you have are familiar with. So I'd like to add that to the agenda. The second item that I'd like to add to the agenda is a request to name me as the manager of the liquor license at Four Seasons Golf. And that's just an interim position until the, the liquor license is transferred. So those two items I'd like to add to the agenda. Okay, any discussion at the board? On the Little Conestoga Creek Foundation request for support, uh, they're, are they requesting any type of financial support? Not from us. It's a grant strictly for, for uh, uh, design and engineering. They're hoping for about four or 500,000 to get kickstart the project. Awesome, okay, thank you. Okay, seeing no one else, uh, I entertain a motion to add these two items to the agenda. So moved. Okay, motion for Mr. Bennett, is there a second? Second. Second for Mr. Weaver, Ms. Schweitzer, please pull the board. Mr. Weaver. Aye. Mr. Bennett. Aye. Mr. Lefever. Aye. Mr. Wigglesworth. Aye. Mr. Russell. Aye, the ayes have it, five nothing. We'll add this to the end of the action items. Thank you. And please remind me when I forget. Thank you. <laughs> okay, next up, we're gonna move up to the action items and I'm going to use the chairman's prerogative to, to juggle the order around. Uh, first thing we're gonna talk about is the uh, Hogs and Heroes Kids bike a -thon. So Ms. Swayze, if you'd like to start, and it looks like we have a couple people in the audience to talk about that. And I guess Ms. Garber too. Uh, yeah, I believe uh, Diane is prepared to address that. Uh, she's been working closely with them. Okay, Ms. Garber, floor is yours. Thank you. Um, Hogs for Heroes PA2 Junior Chapter um, has requested to use a portion of Aher Park for a service project um, that they would like to have their juniors do a children's bike a thon. The date they've requested is June 19th from approximately 8 30 to 12 30 in the morning. And that junior bike a thon would help to raise money to support law enforcement and military organizations, including um, some that they've donated to in the past the COPS program, Angels of Americans Fallen, Lancaster City Police Canine Unit, and also Lancaster City Mounted Police. The event would take place on the east side of the park, as you can see shown in the picture that John put up on the screen. Um, and what it would do would allow them to have a continuous loop of trail for the kids to bike. Um, and the event would begin on the back side or the far east side of the park along the gravel lot that would allow parents to pull in park, remove bikes, um, have a registration tent, water, et cetera there. And then the laps would traverse the park from there. The two yellow spots that you see marked would be um, traffic control points managed by their um, members and then the red marks are where we would block off a portion of the front parking lot so that the kids would have safe passage from one end of the parking lot to the other. Uh, we chose the outer loop of the parking lot to ensure that handicapped access was still readily available to the Dream Park portion of the park. Um, with us this evening are two wonderful ladies um, from the um, both the PA Hogs for Heroes chapter two or junior PA two chapter, um, as well as the ladies, as well as one of the ladies from the PA one adult chapter. And they're here to answer any questions you might have about um, their organization or why they chose the park. They are local to East Hempfield. Um, the kids are local to our school district and our surrounding area. And so um, I bring this before you this evening for your review. And um, if you feel so inclined, your approval. Good evening. Thank you for letting us uh, come before you. Uh, my name is Teresa Dreger, and this is uh, Connie Ray. She, I am actually the state IT for, Pensive, uh, for Hogs and Heroes, and she is the national comptroller. Um, together, we make up the junior committee. And um, Hogs and Heroes stands for honoring our giving spirit and our heroes are our first responders and military. And Connie and I have spent a lot of time working together to find ways to instill those values in our youth. And we in our um, looking at different charities, different events. Yes, um, we are a motorcycle enthusiast group. We are not an MC. We are not a one percenter. We are a 501 C3. We donate over 25,000 
$50,000 a year to COPS alone as a national foundation. Um, three of our chapters here in Pennsylvania are doing COPS, COPS rides, and we would like to do this event here for our youth. Um, I am a resident of 1301 Crown Vets Drive right here in Landisville. Um, my four, three children, and this one, um, here are here as well. They attend Landisville, the Landisville school system. They're very excited. Our neighborhood is very excited for this event. We've been talking about hoping to plan it. Um, I know some of our, lots of our neighbor, neighbors are firemen, are police officers. Um, they're all very excited to work together. Angels of America's Fallen is a charity that specifically benefits um, children whose parents were military or first responders and the parents have passed away. So that would be the charity for this event. Our juniors also do support the Lancaster Canines. Um, I know that our troop, we just did a pizza sale. Our kids raised over close to $1,000 um, together to donate to the, and a lot of that would probably end up going to the Lancaster Canines and Mounted Police. Um, we try to support them as much as we can, but we also want to support, um, do some larger fundraisers. We thought the bike idea would be a great way to get kids out and active, make it a, a community event, let more people learn about uh, Hogs and Heroes and our mission, and then also um, uh, provide, uh, provide a fundraiser for uh, this well-deserving charity. And we were uh, very thankful that uh, Diane and Lieutenant Brubaker were willing to work with us to create this. I know uh, Lieutenant Brubaker said that she was hoping to even bring her own daughter to the event. That's, that's good. It's a wonderful thing that you're proposing. And um, you got a couple former military guys up here. There's three of us. So as I look at this way, two Marines and one Army. <laughs> <laughs> My husband would say something about the Army. He's retired Navy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think this is a good thing. I, my one question is for Diane about what's been coordinated with the other clubs that utilize the field and kind of the heads up being given to them. Yes, there is no use of the soccer fields or anything on the east side of the park that day during the morning hours. And the only thing on the west side of the park is the typical baseball and softball that occurs every day of the weekends through the nice weather. So if you approve the event, we would absolutely reach out to them and just let them know what's going on, um, as well as we discuss some potential um, neighborhood notification just so that they're aware and also if they want to participate. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion of the board? We, uh, Mr. Chairman, we we I, we discussed this with Diane. It's a great event, great organization. The way it sounds, they're very excited. Just be mindful that it's a residential neighborhood. So when you arrive at the event, to to be respectful. That's there will be bikes mm -hmm. involved. Absolutely no problem. We may we will have motorcycles ride in, but there's no need to be respectful of a neighborhood. They're not. Uh, most of our motorcycle riders are. Older, they're not coming in to do wheelies. <laughs> and uh, we'll be, uh, we can certainly mention to please be re mindful that you're riding through a residential area. Yep. Um, and the, the one area of concern, just to be honest, was the, the bottom part of the trail that abuts the houses. Um, they sometimes get concerned about soccer and other activities. So just that's one to be mindful of not crossing the swale for any reason. Um, so that, that, is becomes an issue with the residents anytime kids go down into that soil. So that's just a, a heads up on that. Any other discussion of the board? The only other comment, the only other comment I would have is um, because of the nature of the event and the beneficiaries of the event, whether it might be appropriate for us to re either reduce the, uh, looks like we took a $50 uh, check on this to either reduce or um, eliminate the registration fee. That would as a suggestion. Okay, that's a good suggestion. Anything else at this point? Anybody from the audience at this point? Didn't think there would be anything, so. Well, I think this is a great event and activity. I'm gonna read the uh, the motion here and I'm gonna add in the uh, elimination of the, of the $50 fee. So the motion is to approve the Hawks for Heroes PA2 Junior's application to use Amos Hare Park for a bike a thon on Saturday, June 19, 2021, from 8 30 a.m. to 12 30 p.m. as discussed, and to include a waiver of the application fee. 
So do I hear a motion? So moved. Motion from Mr. Lefevre. Do I hear a second? Second from the chair. Ms. Schweitzer, please pull the board. Mr. Weaver. Aye. Mr. Bennett. Aye. Mr. Lefevre. Aye. Mrs. Wigglesworth. Aye. And thank you. Mr. Russ. Mr. Russell. Aye. Ayes have it five nothing. Mr. Wigglesworth is a former state trooper. Oh, thank, you. <laughs> so, it was, thank you for what you're doing. It's a great thing. And it's good to see you again, too, by the way. <laughs> You can pass that around the neighborhood, yeah. Okay, with that, we're going to get back on to our agenda is development services. And we're going to start off with the Farmstead Homestead Village, the final lot consolidation plan for 28, 2428 Lime Springs Way for final land approval. And also the Farmstead Homestead Village revised final land development plan at 2428 Lime Springs for final plan approval. So the floor is yours. And, and we'll give it to Mr. Beck an introduction first. So Mr. Beck, if you want to introduce the project. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> um, Umstead Village has applied to consolidate all of the lots for the farmstead at Lime Spring Farm. Uh, currently, there's uh, 102 existing lots, and they're going to combine it into one 27.496 acre lot. The lot and all of the uh, um, dwellings and the clubhouse will be served by public water and sewer. The, um, the project was originally approved as a conditional use for development in the village overlay zone, which was part of the 1994 Zoning ordinance has amended. Um, the supervisors approved the conditional use for this project back in um, May 1st, 2013 with an amendment, um, August 2015. Um, at this time, this plan is fairly clean. It has been through reviews by uh, DMA. Um, staff do, does not see any issues with the plan and um, we're happy to see this moving forward um, after the, the initial discussions uh, we've had with Homestead Village. I think this is a move in the right direction and it will, will, it will benefit Homestead Village and the residents. And with that being said, staff is recommending um, approval of the final plan for the lot consolidation for Farmstead at Homestead Village. And why don't we just roll right into the final plan too while we're at. Perfect. If you bear with me, I will bring up the plan. Uh, the, the next plan is the revised final plan for the Farmstead Clubhouse. And that project, <clears throat> I apologize. Um, this is actually the second iteration of plan for the Farmstead Clubhouse, which is um, off to the south southeast portion of the property. This is a revised final plan because there wasn't originally a final plan approved for the Farmstead Clubhouse. At this time, um, Homestead Village is moving in the um, direction um, through feedback that they have from their residents, they will be raising this building and converting two lots back to for residential use and building a brand new clubhouse in the same location. Um, again, this is part of the conditional use and as part of the village overlay uh, zoning district, the um, commercial use is approved and permitted under the 1994 zoning ordinance. As with the lot consolidation plan, this has been reviewed by DMA and staff. We do not see any issues with the plan and we are recommending the board of supervisors approve the final plan um, as presented. I'd like to also point out that neither the lot consolidation plan or the revised final plan require any modifications. Unusual twist. Hey, Mr. Miller, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good evening, Andrew Miller with Rattu Associates. 
here on behalf of Homestead Village. Um, as always, John's overview is excellent. Uh, if you could flip to the next page in the uh, plan set there, just to highlight the, there we go, thank you. Um, just by way of very, very quick overview on the lot consolidation plan, it does take all the individual lots and condense the entire development into one single lot. All the roads will continue to, the internal streets will continue to be uh, privately owned and maintained by Homestead Village. The emergency access over by Mayor Avenue for Roarstown Fire Department will continue to be maintained for their, for their use uh, when they need it throughout the development. Um, and as John stated, no waivers or modifications. Uh, we are in receipt of DMA's letter dated April 20th, uh, which I believe they had a comment or two, which will uh, handle those prior to recording. So we have, we have uh, no issues with that. On the revised final plan, as you can see up on the screen, there's um, a depiction of what the new clubhouse will look like um, in size wise. In addition, they're adding back in the two residential units uh, or the duplex unit rather to the east. If you recall the last plan, we had a parking lot in that area. Um, so we're, we're adding that back in. <laughs> well, there's something on the, oh, that's just mass. If we find it, we'll give you a call. I don't see. Okay. That is odd. Uh, and then in addition to the duplex, we're also adding 15 parking spaces on the north side of Lime Spring Way uh, to just add some additional closer parking for the clubhouse uh, if their residents need it, as well as some additional crosswalks and a drop-off area. Um, so with that, again, DMA issued a letter dated April 20th uh, with a few minor technical items, which we'll clean up prior to plan recording um, as well. So with that, I'd happy to entertain any questions. Um, but it's a, a pretty straightforward uh, project that they're looking to move forward on quickly. Does Thanks. this affect our real estate tax revenue? Homestead Village is a 501c3, correct? That's a great question. Um, and I, I believe they, I believe they are a 501c3. And then all of all the properties have been sold to Homestead Village, which means they would be tax exempt. I thought we had an agreement with that. I think Mr. Stanley's on the and Mr. Motter's on as well. Yeah. So why don't we uh, why don't we turn it over to the guys that developed the agreement in the first place? Mr. Motter can be muted. <laughs> there he goes. <laughs> Diane, can you unmute Mr. Motter? Or Mr. Motter, can you unmute yourself? I unmuted both. Now, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Um, Homestead Village is a tax exempt charitable organization, but we pay, pay property taxes on all of our independent living units. The only part of Homestead Village that does not pay property taxes is our nursing home. And we appreciate that because that's not the case with a lot of our uh, nonprofits. So thank you. You're welcome. So, and I, and I remember that discussion came up when we were originally talking about that too. And they had indicated at that time it was the properties were going to stay taxable. Any other comments or discussions at this point? Thank you for the clarification, Doug. This project does predate me by several years. <laughs> Okay, seeing none, we'll open up to the audience. Any questions from the audience? Okay, seeing none. I'll break these in both separate motions. We're going to need to do that. So the first motion is going to be for a consolidation plan. Motions to approve the Farmstead Homestead Village Lot Consolidation Plan Tangent File 13-15.08. Condition on resolution of all outstanding staff and engineering comments within 90 days of plan approval unless extended by the board for cause shown, or plan approval will be null and void. So do I hear a motion? So moved. Okay, motion for Mr. Bennett. Do I hear a second? Second. Second, Mr. Weaver. Ms. Schweitzer, please pull the board. Mr. Weaver. Aye. Mr. Bennett. Aye. Mr. Lefevre. Aye. Mr. Wigglesworth. Aye. Mr. Russell. Aye, the ayes have it, five nothing. 
Next up is the final plan approval. Motions to approve the, the farmstead at Homestead Village Revised Final Land Development Plan, Township File 13-15.09, conditioned on resolution of all outstanding staff and engineering comments within 90 days of plan approval unless extended by the board for cause shown, or plan approval will be null and void. So do I hear a motion? I'll move. Motion from Mr. Lefevre, do I hear a second? Second. Second from Mr. Bennett. Ms. Schweitzer, please pull the board. Mr. Weaver. Aye. Mr. Bennett. Aye. Mr. Lefevre. Aye. Mr. Wigglesworth. Aye. Mr. Russell. Aye, the ayes have it five nothing. So thank you, Mr. Miller, and, and good job on and to your client for having a plan that required no modifications or waivers. That is a very rare land development plan that we have in this township. So congratulations. Thank you for your time. That's one to put on the wall. <laughs> okay, next up we have the Dutch Valley Auto Works final lot add-on subdivision and land development plan and modifications for Columbia Avenue. Final plan and modification approval. Uh, Mr. Beck, if you'll start us off, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Before you gentlemen tonight, um, it's the final plan for the properties at 3405 Columbia Avenue, which is a single family detached dwelling uh, sitting on approximately 1.325 acres. And um, 3, 3331, which is the address for Dutch Valley Auto Works, which is sitting on 1.932 acres. Um, the final plan will subdivide a portion of lot one, which is the, uh, the lot for the single family dwelling, specifically 0 0.390 acres, and add that to lot two, which will um, make it a 2.867 acre lot. Additionally, the plan also depicts a garage, a 45 foot by 45 foot garage that will be built and an asphalt driveway extension or expansion. Um, however, stormwater management has already been uh, accommodated or has already been installed and will accommodate the, um, the additional impervious um, improvements to the property as part of a previously approved stormwater uh, management small project. This uh, project um, has been to the Lancaster County Planning Commission and the Township Planning Commission. And there are three modifications <clears throat> involving curbing and sidewalk along Columbia Avenue and Richardson Drive. Township engineer and township staff are recommending deferral of all three modifications and are recommending conditional approval of the final plan for the Dutch, Dutch Valley Auto Works project. And you're here for the uh, applicant? Yes, uh, Brent Good with ELA Group for uh, Jeff McCullum, the owner. Uh, John did a nice job explaining that. Again, uh, looking for, as we understand, deferrals of the sidewalk curb and any roadway improvements that adjoin this, uh, what's technically a uh, land development plan. And uh, we are in receipt of the letter from DNA dated April 2nd, uh, find the comments uh, minor, either uh, have no problem addressing the comments or there will be notes, additional notes placed on the plan. And so therefore, um, based on that, um, looking for a conditional approval from you tonight uh, based on those outstanding items. Well, I am glad that your um, owner, uh, the owner of, of this site has decided to resubmit the plan and go through this process. And um, I'm glad that uh, we got over the issues that caused them to want to withdraw the plan in the first place. Um, so we're, we're glad to see him here. Um, I know that these three deferrals were very important to them for even making the project happen since it was such a small item and it's such a large expense to do these work on PennDOT's uh, frontage, um, especially when there is no curb and sidewalk out there today. Um, so I, I again commend your, commend the owner for coming back in and, and resubmitting like he did so. Uh, for reaching back out, uh, as you know, this plan was withdrawn and then uh, we requested a meeting with the owner and uh, reassured him of some things. And so uh, 
thanks for your cooperation as well. So that's yeah. why we're back in front of you tonight. So I'll open this up to the, the board. Any comments or discussions at this point? None. Okay. Anything from the audience at this point? Okay. Um, read them. We'll do the modifications first and then the final plan. So the first one is modifications. Motion to defer. Modification. Motion to defer. Modification request numbers one, two, and three for the Dutch Valley Auto Works final land development plan township file 15-22-04 subject to staff and engineer comments. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Okay, motion for Mr. Bennett and motion. second for Mr. Lefevre. Ms. Schweitzer, please pull the board. Mr. Weaver? Aye. Mr. Bennett? Aye. Mr. Lefevre? Aye. Mr. Wigglesworth? Aye. Mr. Russell? Aye, the ayes have it five, nothing. Next up is a motion to approve the Dutch Valley Auto Works final land development plan. Township file 15-22.04, condition on resolution of all outstanding staff and engineering comments within 90 days of plan approval unless extended by the board for cause shown or plan approval will be null and void. So do I hear a motion? I move. Motion Mr. Weaver and uh, the chair will second. Ms. Schweitzer, please pull the board. Mr. Weaver? Aye. Mr. Bennett? Aye. Mr. Lefevre? Aye. Mr. Wigglesworth? Aye. Mr. Russell. Aye, the ayes have it five, nothing. <clears throat> so thank you, Ms. Thank you, Mr. McCollum for that. So I appreciate it. And we're glad, glad he's in our township and the work he's doing and the business he brings. So thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. Okay, next up, we have the Lime Springs Square rezoning petition acknowledge and authorization to submit a planning review and to advertise for adoption. So, Ms. Schweitzer, do you want to just give a little, a tiny bit of background? I know we don't normally go into great detail at this stage, but a little bit of a background as to... I'm going to pass that off to John. Okay. John, if you can give us a little bit of background on this, this the overall situation and what we have occurring right now and um, gives a little bit of a background um, and before we forward this on to our planning commission yes, for review. Yes, sir. Be my pleasure. Um, for you gentlemen is acknowledgement to, um, I'm sorry, um, is a petition to amend the zoning ordinance uh, to acknowledge it, to authorize staff to send it to the County Planning Commission and the Township Planning Commission and to also authorize the Township staff to advertise it. So on the screen, this portion right here, this is Embassy Drive. This is the um, tire um, Williams? Williams. Yes, Jack Williams Tire. Thank you, Mr. Lefevre. This is Lancaster Farm Fresh. As part of a subsequent uh, land development plan, the property owners will come in and consolidate these two lots into one. And then the original proposal was for two buildings. The new proposal will be for three. But due to some, some um, non-conformities or some issues that they want to prevent with zoning, they are proposing a map amendment to convert this area right here from enterprise zone to regional commerce center zone. And it has to do with the, the, the reconfiguration of these two buildings. The new line, <clears throat> since the property line will be extinguished, the new line will be right here it will be diagonal coming down, and then it will almost meet up with the existing driveway for Lancaster Farm Brush. Okay, any discussion of the board at this point? So reading that in, in preparation, this changes that to conform with the adjoining zoning. Is that or is it is it different than the adjoining? No, currently, currently this area is enterprise and this area is regional commerce center zone. Uh -huh. Due to the reconfiguration of these two new buildings that which will be coming in in a subsequent land development plan, they had to they have to request the rezoning from enterprise to regional commerce center zone for this part this piece right here. Okay, so we'll have Let's two, we'll still this. have the enterprise, but then we'll have the commercial. I understand now. Thank you. 
Okay, any other discussion of the board? Okay, anything from the audience at this point? Okay, seeing none, read the motion here. The motion is to acknowledge the Oak Street Development Group's rezoning petition to authorize staff to submit a rezoning petition to the Lancaster County Planning Commission and East Hemphill Township Planning Commission for review and recommendations and to authorize staff to advertise the rezoning ordinance for adoption. So that is the motion. So moved. Okay, motion for Mr. Lefevre is our second. Second. Second for Mr. Weaver. Ms. Schweitzer, please pull the board. Mr. Weaver. Aye. Mr. Bennett. Aye. Mr. Lefevre. Aye. Mr. Wigglesworth. Aye. Mr. Russell. Aye. The ayes have it five nothing. Okay, next up we have the two associates requesting letter of support for the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation grant submission for the rest, West Branch of the Little Conestoga Creek. I don't know if Ms. Schweitzer or Mr. Beckuer wants to start that. Either, either one, we, we do, we got this request in from our two associates. They are requesting, they are going to be submitting a grant under the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. As I noted previously, it is due tomorrow. They did not tell me what the amounts were. I don't know if John knows, but it's for the West Branch of the Little Conestoga Creek, which there's very little in East Hemfield Township. Most of it is around Todd Lane. And um, that's about all we know. It's for planning purposes. And this is related to that, that watershed group of the municipalities led by it's Mr. It's Stern. Developing, the it's for planning and technical assistance to help develop a watershed action plan for um, the little kind of the West Branch of the Little Conestoga. So Raffo, uh, West Hemfield. It'll be it'll be uh, Manor Township, I believe Mountville, East Hemfield, and West, West. Hemfield. Mm -hmm. Okay. I thought Lancaster Township also. No, this is for the West Branch. This okay. is for okay. the Todd right. Lane area. Yeah, this is not to be confused with the Steinman Correct. project. Correct. Right. Different. And do we know anything more? Just besides the fact it's just a. They require, there's no financial request of us or anything along those lines. No, just support it's just, They're just getting municipal acknowledgements. Which is the municipality that's got the lead with this with them right now? Or which group are they kind of representing? Quite, quite honestly, don't know. Uh, we just received the emails from Kara uh, Cullipson from Ritu uh, asking for the watershed action or for the letters of support. We don't know if uh, any of the other three municipalities are taking the lead. Um, I don't even know if it has anything to do with a an active plan or active project in the area. But do we know who the there has to be somebody who is the applicant on the grant, whether it's a watershed association or one of the municipalities? Well, do you the, know who's got the lead? They do represent all the other three municipalities, so I they didn't really it indicate. A, it could be a joint application with West Hemphill and Manor or something at this point. I, I, I would uh, I would Manor. venture to guess that it would be uh, um, West, West Hemphill. Hemphill. Because Retiro represents West Hemphill and Manor and Lancaster. And Mountville. And Mountville. And Mountville. Yep. <laughs> so everybody, all everybody but us. bus, we're, we're, we're the alternate. Second, there are alternate engineers, so. Okay. Any other questions of the board at this point? It would be good. I, I'm in favor of supporting this, but it would be good um, at least after we, as we put it together, know who we're, what group we're actually supporting. If we can do a little follow up on that, it's, it sounds like a worthy project, but it would be good for us to maybe an email or something after the fact to kind of let us know which group was taking the lead on, which, whether it's a township or the watershed association that was taking the lead on. Any other discussion? I believe your comments are appropriate, Mr. Chairman, and, and, uh, there seems to be a lot we don't know about this. Is it, and this is time. Is this time sensitive at this point? I take it with the value of short notice getting thrown on there. Yeah, short, the the it's due. The application's due tomorrow. Okay. Now they did provide us with a summary. They actually provided us a bit more than what the uh, second request provided to us. But we can ask for the the full submittal, and then who's representing them or who they're representing. Any more discussion of the board at this point? Um, given the time sensitive nature, I'm okay with this. I would normally like to know who the 
applicant is, but if we could at least get an email to let us know who the applicant was, that would be helpful. I must, it has to be either municipality or the watershed association because it has to be a nonprofit that's taking the lead or a government entity. So either one of those groups I would be okay with at this point. So I will entertain a motion to authorize the township manager to sign a letter of support for two associates national fish and wildlife foundation planning and technical assistance grant application to develop a watershed action plan for the west branch of the little conestoga creek so do i hear a motion so moved okay motion from mr weaver do i hear a second second from the chair Ms. Schweitzer, please pull the board mr weaver aye mr bennett aye mr lefevre aye mr wigglesworth aye mr russell aye the ayes have it five nothing you missed the state road. Yeah, okay, thank you. So we're going to backpedal <laughs> for a moment. Mr. Lefevre just made me aware that we skipped over an agenda item and actually a rather important one, which is the reason why we have a guest on the Zoom right now. I see you smiling uh, <laughs> because he's uh, getting a nice chuckle out of this. So we're going to be looking at the state road right away dedication, resolution, maintenance guarantee, and deed of dedication, which is actually very important right now. So, Ms. Schweitzer, if you can start the discussion. And then it looks like we got Mr. Stanley on the line to uh, further elaborate at this point. Mr. Beck is, is prepared to. Okay, Mr. This. Beck, if you could, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll go over the paperwork first. We have a resolution that um, accepts the deed of dedication. We also have a maintenance guarantee. Um, the deed of actual deed of dedication. We have received the maintenance bond. Um, we received it today at uh, noon. We have uh, had a meeting today with the developer to go over opening of the uh, state road, which will occur uh, sometime after um, evening rush hour. So um, after 6 p.m. tomorrow night, um, they will begin to take everything down to open up state road. Uh, the new signal at the air, the hospital access drive um, and the east side access drive. Um, they have a meeting with PennDOT tomorrow, and that will go on flash for at least three days. Um, at this point in time, the, bearing, the, <laughs> the base course has been installed and the wearing course is planned to be installed sometime between in um, middle to uh, middle of June to late or uh, middle of June to early July. They are putting up uh, temporary traffic control devices, and um, the traffic town traffic commission agreed to um, allow staff to handle any issues with the developer and their engineers to reduce the speed limit from 35 to 25 during the active construction periods. Construction traffic uh, will be coming into both sites on the west and east via Harrisburg Pike. And in coordination with st the State Road Commerce Park, um, they are finishing up the improvements for that, those road improvements at the intersection of Yellow Goose Road and State Road. So we will have one lane uh, opening up from Harrisburg Pike all the way up north to 283. Yeah, that's good. Just wanted to add to that. We just found out today during the developers uh, meeting with us that they were awarded their grant, a portion of portion of their grant funding from uh, MTF funding. MTF. So they were awarded some some, some dollars. Uh, they are moving forward with the paving. So we might see that paving, that wear and course down sooner than later but they are working towards that. And they also wanted to give uh, due credit to Ryan Ament, Senator Ryan Ament. He was very instrumental in getting that funding for them. Okay, so this, this is good news. Uh, do we have anybody from the applicant that would like to talk at this point? Mr. Stanley? Mr. Russell, yes, you did see me smiling. Uh, I was about to raise my hand, uh, send a message, I just, was waiting to see what you were going to do. Uh, with me tonight on the phone is both Eric Scott and Craig Malott. Um, we are very happy to offer um, the realigned state road for dedication to the township. Um, 
we've worked very uh, closely with your solicitor on the review and approval of all the documents, uh, your township engineer for the review of the legal descriptions uh, and staff. Um, earlier today, we uh, were attended, uh, we attended the uh, uh, traffic commission meeting uh, and the traffic commission approved the signage plan. Um, and with that as a background, we're here to answer any questions you have, but um, a lot of work has gone into uh, getting us to the point where we are right now. Uh, the documentation has been reviewed by staff, your engineer and your solicitor. Uh, and uh, we ask uh, for the board support and accepting the dedication of the realigned state road. Thank you, Mr. Stanley. And thank your clients for uh, working with us to get this road we opened up. Uh, that's greatly appreciated. I know you had a lot of hurdles to go through and dealing with COVID did not make the construction season go faster either. Um, so I appreciate everything that has been done to get the expedition of the work going at this point uh, in 2021. And I know the, uh, the residents will certainly appreciate that part being open and will greatly appreciate the bridge work being complete. Um, and so hopefully by fall, we have all three with this and um, the other development project and the state uh, project all complete. And we have a fully functioning roadway that is now able to handle the, the traffic that's it currently sees in a very good manner at this point from state road all the way to the interchange. And that would be a good thing for our residents and something that's been 15 years in the making at this point, so. Mr. Stanley, are you going to hold the celebration party until the bridge is also complete and we'd have one event? <clears throat> I know that there's been discussions with your manager. Uh, we thought that it might be appropriate, uh, obviously to work very closely with you and follow your lead, uh, but there, it may be, uh, the timing may be a little better if we can coordinate it with the application of the wearing course and then the opening of the bridge project. So it would be uh, a brief ceremony uh, once that uh, all those components are done and are in place. I think that would be nice. And it would be nice to give a couple accolades to a couple of people that had happened to make that project happen, especially the state road um, interchange project too. Um, so that would, uh, there's been a lot of moving pieces. So I, I just appreciate, I know how complex getting two different land development projects and PennDOT all working on the same page, as well as dealing with Amtrak as the wild card through all this. Um, it's, it's been a long time coming and it's, it's going to be nice to see this roadway open up and operating the way it was designed to operate. Any other discussion of the board at this point? I just like to comment. I, it'll be a great day tomorrow when this uh, when this happens. Um, and I'm very appreciative of the work that the developer and everyone has uh, put into the the effort here with uh, with the new road. Um, just one question on the light at Yellow Goose and Harrisburg Pike. What's going to happen there, and when will it happen? I think it's already done. There are. I think those those lights are temporary lights. But the, the structures are all there. I'm not quite sure what you're referring to. Well, Harrisburg Pike and Yellow Goose. And Yellow Goose. We have a, as part of the detour. The detour obviously oh, will, the, oh, oh. Will, end, will end tomorrow. The, the detour light. Right, the detour light. Okay, gotcha. Will, will the detour light remain there pending the construction that's going to, I mean, pending we, the, the new work that's going to happen on Yellow Goose? We debated that back and forth earlier today. I think Mr. Malat was going to uh, get an answer for us. There was confusion as to uh, their detour plans linked to several other detour plans mm -hmm. in terms of the exchange or the interchange. So we didn't have an answer at that time. I don't know if we do now or not. Well, it's, it's on the radar. You're, look, you're yes. looking at it. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, we're thinking it's probably going to get removed right after the road is opened, but we're not sure of that. And it wasn't put in with the act of the act of the board either, was it? At this point, I can't remember. No, it it was. The question is whether it's tied to the detour specifically or the HOP work 
for PennDOT. And that's what uh, Mr. Malott is checking into and to see <clears throat> how we can proceed with getting the temporary signal removed. And ultimately, PennDOT calls the shots as to when it goes up and when it goes down. Yes, sir. Okay. okay. Craig, can you uh, update the board as to what our plans are? Sure, Cindy and the board. We um, we spoke with the contractor Mark and I did later this or earlier this afternoon. The temporary signal in Harrisburg Pike and Yellow Goose is only supposed to be there while the detour is in place. So when the detour comes down tomorrow, the intent is to have the temporary signal at Harrisburg Pike and Yellow Goose will come down soon thereafter. I think the estimate the contractor gave us is Friday morning. Uh, the temporary signal there will be taken down. Did we have uh, did we put our flashing sign up to say new track? Give the people a heads up that that's that that change is coming. That section, Perry, would that be available to put up out up out there? The flashing uh, signal. I think it's out front right now. Yeah, uh, where where would you like it to to be located? I'm thinking something along um, Yellow Goose. Basically, people that have grown accustomed to there being a signal there mm -hmm. are going to soon realize there's not one there. Sure, we we can kind of put it at the mm -hmm. end of. I'm assuming like the Tomlinson Bomberger property. Give yeah, them somewhere in there, just give them like a day's notice that the signal's going to go away or something like that. So I can get that up there tomorrow, hopefully. Any other discussion of the board at this point? I'm just looking forward to it being open. <laughs> we all are at this point. <laughs> Everyone. Although the Yellow Goose Road act detour actually did work rather well, just for the, the record. I've Not driven that, that a lot. It actually... Um, there was actually less delay just because you basically had a uh, yellow goose intersection that operated very efficiently because they didn't have the state road traffic with it. So, right. Okay. So anything from the audience at this point? Okay. Seeing none, we'll read this. So it is going to be one motion for all this. It's motion to adopt resolution 2021-18 approving the DIA dedication and road maintenance agreement and to establish $479,711.25 as the road maintenance guarantee. So do I hear a motion? So, so Okay, motion from Mr. Lefebvre, do I hear a second? Second. Second from Mr. Bennett. Ms. Schweitzer, please pull the board. Just for clarification, the ordinance number is 20, or the resolution number is 2120. Um, Mr. Weaver. Aye. Mr. Bennett. Aye. Mr. Lefebvre. Aye. Mr. Wigglesworth. Mr. Russell. Aye, the ayes have it, five nothing. The road will be open. Okay, so thank we- Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Stanley, and thank your client too, please. We will do that. Uh, we had already covered the first ad item to our agenda, the Little Conestoga Creek Foundation at this point. Uh, so it looks like the next item to cover before we move on to new business is going up and then I'm saying you want to mix up. Well, we'll, we'll do this. So, so next item would be to appoint Cindy Schweitzer as the manager for Four Seasons Liquor License. So Ms. Schweitzer, could you explain that real quickly, please? So right now the uh, Mac Cafe, which is the former Four Seasons snack bar, they are up and running and being uh, run by uh, Ron Gold and um, Kevin White, who represent Blue Collar. Uh, restaurant and catering. They do not have the liquor license at this point in time. It still remains with the township. Our former manager resigned, or not resigned, retired at the end of this past year. So we need to appoint a new manager. So in the interim, I uh, am requesting that I get appointed as an interim manager for the liquor license until such time as it's transferred, which should be very soon. Okay, any discussion of the board at this point on that matter? Okay, see none, any from the audience? Okay, see none, I entertain a motion to appoint Ms. Cindy Schweitzer as the manager of the Four Seasons Liquor License as discussed. So moved. Uh, motion for Mr. Weaver, do I hear a second? Second. Second for Mr. Bennett, Ms. Schweitzer, please pull the board. Mr. Weaver? Aye. Mr. Bennett? Aye. Mr. Lefevre? Aye. Mr. Wigglesworth? Aye. Mr. Russell? Aye. The ayes have it, five, nothing. Mr. Chairman? Yes. You also have a second uh, addition to the agenda, which was the Little Conestoga Foundation. 
you did there were two requests okay that, that was what got me confused so then we'll we will talk about the little Conestoga foundation has requested a letter of support for the grant applications of the national fish and wildlife foundation with a submission deadline of same thing tomorrow just like the other one Correct. Ms. Weitzer, do you want to explain that real quick? <laughs> so this is for the Little Conestoga Creek, which is the Steinman Foundation project that uh, you are fairly familiar with. This is starting at the Lancaster Township end at the trailhead. They are looking at design and engineering costs. Uh, as far as I know, it's between four and five hundred thousand dollars that they're requesting, and it's being uh, requested by the Little Conestoga Creek Foundation. And going back to Mr. Ben's original question, this one too has no financial obligations at this point. Correct. It's just a support letter. Okay. Any other questions of the board right now? Anybody from the audience? That okay. would not be a matching grant. I am not familiar with the, the particulars of those grants well, they, they typically they are they didn't ask any monies from us they didn't know so no monies from us grant though though we'll look for it might be coming from the foundation and they had already planned on giving five hundred thousand toward the design and, and engineering of that process this is helping offset their their costs right. right now i'm working on an assumption just just like the last one there was no request of us for money at this point so none whatsoever uh, we're committing to is that we're just Support of the project. Um, Correct. Do we know more about it? At least this one, we know who the applicant is. Yes. Okay, so I will entertain a motion uh, to provide a letter of support for Little Conestoga Creek Foundation in support of their grant application to the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation with a submission deadline of tomorrow. So, do I hear a motion? I move. Mr. Mr. Weaver, do I hear a second? Second from the chair. Ms. Schweitzer. Mr. Weaver. Aye. Mr. Bennett. Aye. Mr. Lefever. Aye. Mr. Wigglesworth. Aye. Mr. Russell. Aye. The ayes have it five nothing. Okay, now we'll move on to item B for action items to special events. We already covered the Hogs for Heroes. We have a whole bunch of special events. Mrs. Garber, you're going to be very busy for the next few minutes. So <laughs> Uh, if you can just run through all of them at this point, we'll go with GTO, Penn Legacy, and the Line for Life Ministries. If you just go one down the other, it'd be appreciated. Absolutely not a problem. Um, you should all at this point be very familiar with Susquehanna Valley GTO. This is their annual All Pontiac Car Show. It will occur on Saturday, August 21st, with setup on August 20th. No changes to anything that has occurred in the past and no issues in the past. So it would be our recommendation that you approve their application to hold the car show as indicated. The second special event application is for Penn Legacy. Um, I'm sure in your packet you can see there are about um, 20 dates listed that they will be utilizing different facilities, um, including the Amos Her Park. They have significantly downsized the size of their events due to the current um, global pandemic. And um, of most importance on their application is that you would approve the signing of the roadway indemnification form um, so that they can utilize fire police and constables to direct traffic on Junction Road, Lidditz Road, Greystone Road, and Landisville Road during their modified tournaments as included in the dates on the application. No changes to anything they've done in the past there as well, and anything that they have done as far as notifications for neighborhoods and so on will continue with these events. And then last, previously, or known as Susquehanna Valley Pregnancy Services, is now known as Align Life Ministries. This is their annual 5K Run Walk for Life to be held at the Junction Center. Again, important to this application is the signature on the indemnification agreement, allowing them to close Junction Road for approximately one hour on Saturday, May 8th. That is a rain or shine event and will occur from 9 till 10 o'clock. They have been in contact um, with the neighboring municipalities and have approval from there as well. They will utilize fire police from Mannheim and East Petersburg fire companies to do the street control or the traffic control on that street. So those are the three special events you have before you. 
and staff recommends the approval of all and signature on the indemnification forms. And for the uh, the third one for the Junction Road, it was assumed that they would still allow local access with the fire. Yes. Yep. So there shouldn't be any real issue with that road closure. Then. And has not been in the past. Any discussion of the board about these three applications? Yes, I'd like to make a couple of comments um, on the Penn Legacy event. Um, these are a lot of days when uh, potentially Aher Park is going to be utilized in a, in a very uh, substantial way that may limit access to residents. On all of these dates, will Aher Park be utilized as part of the uh, tournaments that, that happen here? No, these dates include Aher Park, Crider Field, Sporting Valley Turf Fields, the Junction Center Fields, and the Hempfield High School Athletic Fields. Do you know which events will impact Aher Park? I do not have them broken out specifically by date. Okay. Um, yeah, I just do have a little bit of concern there about about the the heavy use of the park on on all of these states and how it may impact the community. I did just find a note. Amos Her Park will most likely be requested only for Hempfield Fall Classic. Application for use can follow at a later date, and the dates for the Hempfield Fall Classic are the thirteenth and fourteenth of November and the twentieth and twenty first of November. Okay, that makes it that makes it a, a better situation in, in my view. So I'm I'm good with that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And your discussion on the board. Okay, these are three very long motions, and so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to consolidate. We discussed all three motions. Everything's on the application, and so I will entertain a motion to approve the three applications as discussed. So moved. Okay, motion, Mr. Lefevre, is our second. Second. Second for Mr. Bennett. Ms. Schweitzer, please pull the board. Mr. Weaver. Aye. Mr. Bennett. Aye. Mr. Lefevre. Aye. Mr. Wigglesworth. Aye. Mr. Russell. Aye. The ayes have it five nothing. Thank you, Ms. Garber. Next up, we have the Spooky Nook existing MOU for fire police request by staff to discontinue the MOU. So who wants to explain this one a little bit? That will be Diane. Ms. Garber, the floor is yours. This one is interesting. Absolutely. So several years ago, in order to allow Spooky Nook Sports staff to control traffic on Spooky Nook Road and on Champ Boulevard, we created a memorandum of understanding between um, the township, Hempfield Fire Department, and Spooky Nook Sports. And what that allowed us to do was create a standard that was necessary for their staff to follow, including membership with Hempfield Fire Company and swearing in as fire police so that we were um, within the boundaries of the law to provide traffic control on the roadways. At that time, they had a significant number of staff who um, took the appropriate training, were sworn in as fire police and members of Hempfield Fire Department. Since then, over the last several years, those numbers have dwindled significantly. They're down to approximately two people now. They are not meeting the standards included in the agreement and they are not regularly providing their own traffic control on the roadways and instead using constables. And so Chief Skiles and I spoke, um, Josh Newcomer, the Chief at Hempfield Fire Department and I spoke and then Chief Skiles reached out to Spooky Nook Sports um, and the memorandum specifically indicates that in order for it to be terminated, written notice must be provided by one of the parties. And so it is um, our recommendation at this time that we um, provide that written notice to Spooky Nook Sports as they are not in compliance with the agreement and it is not currently being utilized. Therefore, they will be required to use constables and or I guess hiring police officers to manage traffic. They must still manage the traffic. Yes? Yes, correct. They will continue to manage the traffic, but will have to utilize other sources other than their own staff, which they have been doing as necessary for events. It sounds like they've been probably having to do it for most of these events if they don't have the fire police anymore. 
Is there any reason what, what happened that caused us to, to fall apart at this point? It seemed like it had so much promise originally. They've had a significant amount of turnover in their staff over the years. Um, and it was difficult to keep the people on staff who had the training. It is a significant training class to get fire police certification. Um, and I believe it was easier, maybe not as cost effective, but less time consuming and simple to simply um, utilize the resources that are already in place. Chief Skiles, did you want to add? No, I think you covered it. If they choose to uh, get their training up to speed, though, they uh, we can notifying them that they need to step up or are we canceling it, or is this a notice that we are canceling it? I guess my question is, if they want to continue, do they have the option of getting their people up to speed? Currently, they would have to have several additional staff members become qualified and join as members of Enfield Fire Department and then be sworn in through you, the Board of Supervisors, to meet the constraints of the agreement. We set a minimum number that they had to have to maintain the program. Um, Chief Skiles has been in contact with their um, director, and we haven't seen any um, response from them that would make us believe that they're intending to make any changes toward increasing the number of staff that they have in place or that removing this MOU is problematic for them. In fact, I don't believe that he even knew it existed from the response that we received. Thank you. If we withdraw the MOU, then the two or whatever remaining staff they have would no longer be qualified. Is that true? Correct, and I, and I passed that on today. I told them they would not be allowed to be on the street directing traffic once we, once we terminate it. Mr. Oh. Chairman, I have a question. Yes, Mr. Rogosworth. So my question is, do they know that this is coming and are they on board with the action that we are, that is being proposed tonight? I would say they were made aware of it over a week ago um, and again yesterday that we were going to take this action tonight. They did not tell me that they wanted to, to extend it. In fact, uh, what I was told was um, that they don't use it very often. Maybe at the end of the night, the two, the two employees might go out on the road to clear traffic. Um, and that was the extent of it. It would be my recommendation that if, if they want to revisit it, then we could create another MOU down the road. But at this point in time, uh, having, having two other people isn't really doing any benefit for us or for them. But back to Mr. Wigglesworth's question, have we had a conversation with Nook Sports at this point? Uh, I would call it a one a one sided conversation. I I reached out to them twice and uh, didn't get very far. So I'll be diplomatic and say they were advised and we didn't get much feedback other than thank you. And I reached out to them once with the same response. That sounds like they are currently not compliant with their training is that so they would have to you know get additional training just to stay to keep their certification is that right yes what determines when they should or must have traffic control because i've witnessed that that's a mess over there whenever they have a large event it, the reality is that they don't need to put anybody out on the street. Um, they were really doing that as a matter of uh, customer service for their patrons to get them in and out faster. But ultimately, if they chose not to control the traffic, that would fall on the police department. Um, early on, when they first opened up, their parking lot wasn't finished. They didn't have a parking flow plan. Um, that would that would handle the amount of traffic going in and out. We've had full parking lots there and minimal problems. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Regal, sir. Um, I'm not against what's being proposed. I just rather that um, 
either a board member, you, I, or somebody else in the board, at least reach out to them. And I don't want to create a problem where there isn't one, and, and maybe this needs to happen, um, but I don't feel urgency for it. And I would at least like to, to have a conversation with the management there from the board to them, if that's possible. Who, who have we reached out to so far? I guess it would be, who was the contact at Nook Sports that we've been reaching out to? It's been kind of non-responsive. Is that head of their security, Diane? We've reached out to the head of security, the president and the operation manager. President being Mr. Byler. No, he's he's the owner. The, the president is, uh, Diane, do you have, is it Jim? Lauder. Yeah, Jim Lauder. <clears throat> Chris Lighty is a security manager, and I'm not sure the operations manager changed, but all, all three have been copied in correspondences back and forth over the last two weeks. We also currently have fire suppression um, concerns over there, and they've been very unresponsive to our communications in reference to those as well, both Hempfield Fire Department and um, than myself because they weren't responding to the fire department. So, in accordance with Mr. Wigglesworth's concerns, I'm sensing a potential for a problem. And I would just like to suggest that we do something in writing to Spook Nook Sports officials that establishes a clear understanding of this matter and our position. Not, not just this matter, but the, the matter of being non-responsive. Well, yeah. I think that's the bigger issue. If they were, if we had communication, we could talk. And so first we got to get the communication established. I th it does not sound like, and nor would I have expected that we've reached out to the owner at this point yet, but it sounds like we're at the point where it might be good to reach out to Sam Byler and go over the heads of those that are being non-responsive just to establish communication. Let's let staff take another crack at this, and we'll bring it back. Well, I follow. I agree with you. I think it should be in writing. And, I, and we... I think it needs to go to Mr. Byler. Yep. It needs to go to the top at this point with with a request for a meeting. Sure. Just to get Mr. The, Chairman. The meeting is just to get the communications open and going. Sure. At this point, we have a personal injury situation occur. We will be glad if we've documented where we are. Because if we're talking more than just fire police, but fire department issues not being responded to, and other things. It sounds like we need to get the communication reestablished. Mr. Chairman, if it's okay with you, I'll reach out to Mr. Byler tomorrow. I leave that to you and Mrs. Schweitzer. Thank you. If the, if the board okay with that approach at this point? Yes. Yep. Um, since we did, we had this on, this was an action item, so I'll entertain a motion to the table. So moved. Okay, motion from Mr. Ben. Do I have a second? Second. Second, Mr. Lefevre. Ms. Schweitzer, please pull the board. Mr. Weaver. Aye. Mr. Bennett. Aye. Who's next on my list? <laughs> Sorry. Mr. Lefevre. Aye. Mr. Wigglesworth. Aye. Mr. Russell. Aye. The ayes have it five nothing to table. Okay, next up we have the uh, Planning Commission alternatives, appointments to fill vacancies. I guess I'll turn it over to Mr. Beck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, on uh, April 14th, the uh, Planning Commission um, discussed the candidates and ultimately they um, focused on three of them. Um, it was, uh, I'm, I don't have my memo <clears throat> typed out, but it was uh, John Spangler. John Spangler Thank you, Andy. I appreciate that. John Spangler, Ryan Ulrich, Ryan Ulrich and um, Josh Joshua Boltby. Boltby. In that order, um, they eventually did um, prioritize all of the candidates. Um, so it would have been uh, John Spangler, Ryan Ulrich, Josh Boltby, Mike Rush, and um, Charles um, Brought. Thank you, Cindy. So with that being said, um, Township staff respectfully requests the uh, board uh, appoint two new members 
to the existing vacancies for the Planning Commission. <clears throat> okay. Uh, what about zoning? <clears throat> they have not met, and uh, I, um, Cindy and I felt it may be the will of the board to wait for the Zoning Hearing Board to meet in May to get a recommendation from them. Did they discuss or say anything at this point? Not as a board, no. No. I've given thought to this matter through the interviews. We felt um, serious regret for one instance where the Planning Commission could not make a quorum. And so we have thought it appropriate, and I believe to an extent it has been appropriate that we have expanded alternates so that we are sure to always have a quorum there. I have concerns that if we appoint several, two or so more alternates, we deny ourselves an opportunity if there's another candidate that might come along in the not too distant future that could be a, an asset to us. Um, I don't know that I think any of the candidates have, a, have a, an interest that is overwhelming. And I, I would say that to my recollection, none of them attended any meetings to find out what it's all about. And so what I'd like to do, I actually would be more than happy to stall or table this action and advise the applicants that the board has determined that we'd like them to begin to attend meetings and see how their interest continues or develops stronger, et cetera. Um, there's different opinions as to the qualifications of the different applicants. And I believe this is important that we appoint someone that really has an interest and will be an asset. As I've viewed planning commission, and as I've viewed uh, the uh, hearing board on few occasions, but nevertheless have viewed, we have some members that don't contribute much, if anything. Um, the boards are led by the chair and vice chairs and the leaders as is appropriate, but I look for more participation and there are, there are some regular members that, that have spoken and contributed. So I'm not settled on appointing more alternates at this time where I don't see a need. Thank you. Any other discussion of the board before I speak? Uh, you know, I support much of what Mr. Lefevre is saying, and and we, we and we currently do have uh, an alter, alternate available for each board. So there's no real hurry here, in in my view. So I would uh, uh, I would be okay with moving this out a little bit and su again, suggesting to the applicants or the, or the uh, candidates here that, um, you know, they attend a planning commission meeting and see if their interest level continues. Thank you. Mr. 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 Chairman, I did have a comment or two on this. Um, I know we did receive a memo um, from Mr. Garinger, from the Zoning or from Planning Commission, uh, requesting um, appointment onto the Zoning Hearing Board. To me, that's a no-brainer. Um, and I did feel that we did have some qualified candidates. We put five people through interviews in front of 10, 15 people. Um, and now to go back to them and say, <laughs> wait a minute, we're not sure about your commitment. I don't know that that's a wise move. Um, that's just my take. I think we should make some appointments here this evening. 
I don't I I can understand where Mr. Lefevre is coming from. Maybe we don't need to fill all of the positions and we eliminate some if, if that's the feeling that we have too many. Um, but I do think we should make make some appointments tonight. Let me ask a, a question that's going to put Mr. Beck on the spot a little bit. How many alternates have gotten into the plan commission seats over the last couple of years? How many? Yeah. You're just going off the rough of your head. Like, and that Brett Denner was an alternate at one point. Six. So, Brett Denner, Julie Will, Dan Caldus, uh, Matt Palakowski. So five, five or six. Okay, over the last couple of years. Within within the last three, within the last two and a half, three years. So we've been going almost two of two two alternates becoming a planning commission member, almost on. Since since I've been the director, we have lost. I shouldn't say put it that way. There have been uh, um, at least four people in the planning commission that have um, stepped down or resigned for what uh, one reason or another. Um, Keith Falco in um, the end of 2016, um, Jim Hackett. Um, Dan, can't think of his last name. That was before Keith. That was before my time. Thank you, Andy. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, James, um, Mike, uh, <laughs> and of course we lost Andy to the election. So um, we've seen quite a bit of turnover on the planning commission. And um, I, would, I would say my time with the planning commission, um, yes, it is a little bit difficult, especially for people that are not familiar with the process or the terminology, but um, I'm gonna use Mrs. Will, for instance. I think she's taken a very um, proactive approach as much as she could on the Planning Commission. And um, in the past year, she has really uh, matured in that role. And um, I, I can't stress it enough, I think out of both the Zoning Hearing Board and Planning Commission, um, we absolutely do need three alternate members of the Planning Commission for the simple fact that the legal requirement for a 90 day to act on a plan within 90 days. If the Zoning Hearing Board cannot make a quorum, there's a buffer established in the MPC to allow them to push it off at least a month. And we have a stat, we have protections in our agenda are our meeting dates. So to ensure that there's two zoning hearing board meetings. But if we run up on an, a situation where we have a developer that is not as um, friendly or as willing to negotiate and work with the township as some of the ones we have had in the, in the recent past, and we get up onto an issue where there's a 90, they're coming up on the 90 day date and uh, some emergency happens and the planning commission cannot meet. The, the board cannot take action on a plan without it going to the planning commission first and having them provide a review. And I kind of look at the, I, I do have a, a little bit different perspective. I look at the alternates as getting experience so that they can step into a position. So, because it requires them to attend the meeting and participate in the meeting and learn. And every one of these alternates that we've moved on, just because your alternate is not a guarantee that you're going to move on to the, the planning commission, it still takes an act of the board to do that, just like it takes an act of the board to appoint an alternate. Uh, but this is how we build the bench uh, with people coming in here. And I do think that we had some qualified candidates that applied for the, the positions. Um, I think as a compromise, and I would be willing to do a compromise, uh, just because the zoning hearing board has not met yet, I think I would be willing to uh, wait till that occurs, just as a courtesy, just like we did with our planning commission. Doesn't mean we're going to agree with what they come back with as a recommendation, uh, but I think uh, we um, would be uh, just prudent to give them the same treatment that we give in the planning commission. But upon that completion of that meeting and their their discussion of it, I think we should be taking action. We went through this whole process of interviewing these individuals 
It's we they deserve an up or down vote for appointments. If they're not qualified, that's one thing. And I think there could be an argument that two of the candidates weren't qualified. Um, but I think we gotta give them an option. And I think the zoning hearing board needs to know that Dennis Geringer has, as of yesterday, again, reiterated his interest on being on the zoning hearing board. And he's the only one so far that has shown any interest on being on the zoning hearing board that I'm aware of. We, I, I, I originally got the email from Cindy and I passed along to all of the planning commission members. So they were all aware. Colin um, passed along to the zoning hearing board. So they are aware. But they've not talked about it yet. Um, as a commission. They have not, no, they have not discussed that as a, as a full board. We have heard um, some, some uh, responses back from one or two, but um, nothing from the whole zoning hearing board. Okay. So my position is I'm willing to hit the pause button, but I do think we need to take action on these. I think we, they interviewed, we went, we grilled them pretty good at this point. Uh, quite frankly, a lot of municipalities would have loved to have any one of the five that had applied because uh, they struggled to even get anybody to take interest in this. And we have five applying for three positions at this point. So I think we, we kind of owe them this. I do think on the planning commission, more so than the zoning hearing board, we've had a lot of turnover. Um, and these individuals, if they're qualified, serve as the bench to get the training. They get to see how things operate. They get a year of not actually voting, and then they get put in, thrust into the seat if they're ready and up and able. And we've had some of our alternates drop out too. Am I correct, Mr. Beck? And we had an alternate drop out? Yes, we, yes, we have um, um, Ms. DiPerno. Yeah. Because and that, it was just a function of uh, work, scheduling and scheduling things going on. So it does give them a chance to see whether they truly are gonna be able to commit to the time requirements while they're serving as an alternate. So, so that, that's my, my perspective. I would be satisfied with your proposals, especially since if Mr. Geringer does go to zoning hearing board, then we would want to for planning. So um, Three. I'm all right with that, but I just, I've had those thoughts and concerns and I needed to share them. Okay. Mr. Regulus, are you okay with basically just deferring or tabling until the, plan, the zoning hearing board meeting? You mean, are we tabling all the appointments or what are uh, we? It is a chain event. I mean, Mr. Garinger needs to vacate a seat. Uh, so there really, there is a, there is a process that needs to occur and it begins with him. Okay. No, okay. I, I, I'm fine with that. I just, I don't think we need to re-advertise and start the process over. So that's fine. So with that, I'll entertain a- this, Mr. Chair, I just, I did want to ask if, so that all the board members are aware, um, the only response we got back as staff from the planning commission about Mr. Geringer um, putting out his name to go to the zoning hearing board was Mr. Fullerton. He indicated that he saw it as a separate issue and um, they would address that if it came, if and when it came up. So um, if zoning hearing board is going to weigh in on Dennis Geringer becoming a member of the zoning hearing board, it may affect how some of the other, some of the members of the planning commission feel on their appointments or their, their uh, suggestion recommendations for alternates. That, that's fine. I just want to emphasize again, I appreciate the zoning hearing board and the planning commission offering their opinions, but ultimately the board of supervisors are the ones that do the appointment. And we have the responsibility of making sure that we feel our boards are representing and representative of the township. And so really it is, when I look at the planning commission and the zoning hearing board participating in interviews, it's really, can they see themselves working with the individual or not? Um, beyond that, it really falls under our purview as to the makeup and what these boards look like at this point. I wanna give the zoning hearing board the same opportunity, in my opinion as chairman, the same opportunity that the planning commission had to weigh in, but ultimately it's our decisions as to who we appoint. Has Mr. Longenecker as an alternate been active in the zoning hearing board? No. Pardon? No. No, I had that 
Senate. I, I think with the planning commission, they did rank their choices. So that would kind of cover the situation if Mr. Garinger moves to the zoning hearing board, which I agree with Mr. Wigglesworth would be a, uh, he'd be a great asset to them, I think. And um, I previously said that I think the planning commission should make the choice, but I think whoever is chosen by the will of the board should have a, as close to unanimous backing from us as possible. So I would defer to the group um, choice. So I think, I think they need our support, okay. whoever's chosen. Does uh, zoning hearing know of Mr. Garinger's interest in moving there? Yes, uh, Colin forwarded the email with his list of qualifications or parameters that he he uh, outlined in his email and his willingness to um, resign from the planning commission to be appointed to the zoning hearing board. Colin forwarded all that information to each zoning hearing board member. Again, to sort of follow up on the, on the chair's uh, suggestion about, you know, recommendation. Um, should we formally, do we need to formally request a list of recommendations from the zoning hearing board based upon Mr. Geringer's um, possible appointment there? If that's the will of the board, staff will <clears throat> We'll direct the zoning hearing board to consider all five applicants that were interviewed, plus Mr. Garinger. Well, they the, the five that were interviewed, they most of them said they would go either place. So, uh, you know, once we have an idea of how zoning hearing feels, maybe zoning, maybe, and I'm not sure, but maybe zoning hearing feels strongly stronger about someone else. We should know that. Not again, not that we need to put a rubber stamp on it, but we, you know, we should know that just like we, we have an idea from planning. And I think we can just make a better decision that way. Understood. Okay. Mr. Chairman. That's Mr. Rosler. Uh, just one comment, and I, I'm willing to uh, submit to the will of the board here as, as well on this, but just something that occurred to me, uh, you know, we're gonna be asking them for their input. Um, and in my mind, there's just absolutely no reason that we would not Point, Mr. Garinger, Mr. Garinger, to that board. Um, however, suppose they come back. I'm just being devil's advocate here and give you a ranking, and he's not on there. Um, then we just ask for their input, and we totally uh, shunned it. I mean, that could be a scenario that we should all be aware of. Well, again, that was why I was emphasizing they can recommend, but ultimately we're the ones that appoint. Okay. Very I appreciate good. that it's but it's the same thing with the plank we gave the planning commission that that same that same treatment where they got to at least weigh in and, and provide the recommendation to us doesn't mean we have a duty as a board though to evaluate the candidates and feel make who we feel is the best fit at this okay. point, so yeah we could wrap this up right now but yeah but it'd be good to give them just being fair at this point. All right. So with that, uh, I want to entertain a motion that we table this. When do we have the next zoning hearing board meeting? May 24th. Okay, so this would be on our June, first June meeting yes, for sir. action at this point. So I have a motion that we table. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, motion for Mr. Lefebvre, second for Mr. Bennett. Ms. Schweitzer, please pull the board. Mr. Weaver? Aye. Mr. Bennett? Aye. Mr. Lefevre? Aye. Mr. Wigglesworth? Aye. Mr. Russell? Aye. The ayes have it, five nothing. Okay, no old business, any new business. I do have a new business item if anybody else does not have one. So I'm gonna put my PSATS hat on for a moment. Uh, we had talked about uh, people attending the convention, uh, the conference. It was obviously canceled, we, but we were talking about the educational benefits. The virtual classes and training starts in a couple of weeks. Um, and I would like to encourage supervisors um, and staff to attend that. And there is a fee, just like we would have paid a, a fee. There is a fee, $99. There's a fee. No, it was, it was refunded. 
No, 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 no. There's no, a the fee. Virtual was the virtual, the virtual classes. There is a fee. No, I, I just registered and it was completely zero for the virtual classes. Yes, sir. I just There's... registered yesterday for classes for the next two weeks and it was completely free. They might be pulling it out of this registration. Then it might be coming. There's, it's, I can guarantee it's not free. It's ninety nine dollars. Right. So there's there's something wrong then if if that that occurred. There there was a there was an email and I'll be happy to share it with Cindy. I'm sure she got it too. But um, I went in and added to the cart and it was it was nothing. And I even got an email saying that the ninety nine dollar registration fee was refunded or will be refunded after May first. Yeah, I'm not sure either. Okay. I was on the impression it was 99. I, yeah, I still am under the pressure. I just had an email from PSATS, but um, I would like to encourage us to participate in that. What is the course or courses? Is it's just like, it's just like the, uh, it, it's on the website. It, it basically, once you register, it would be just like you're at the event, you would attend the classes. They're just all being done by Zoom at this point. And are we going to get this as an email? Could we send something out? Probably should have, but yes, I can certainly send it out. Yeah. Okay. So if you can send that, I'd, I'd like that to go to the, the board members, any staff that's interested in attending, as well as we so talked about just, planning commission members too. Not just boot camp. It's 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 a full it's the full training for half okay. half the price, and you right. you can be in your pajamas and watch it at ten o'clock at night if you want to. Yeah, I think most of them are recorded. We're going to record every live. one of them, and you can over a course, so you actually can see more classes than, than you would normally see if you're at PSETS. Yeah. Okay. So it's a good deal. I would encourage us to take advantage of it. Um, Ms. Switzer, if you can maybe sure. shoot an email out and if everybody can get back to her by Friday or so, um, it, that's going to take long. You either you're in for it or not at this point. Um, and then we get that to PSETS at this point. Um, it would be, uh, it's a good thing for us to participate in the training. There's a lot of a lot of good classes that they teach there and a lot of good learning opportunities. And this is a unique opportunity where you can literally watch it in your pajamas at night um, after it's been recorded. So you talk about uh, people that want to get involved with the township and, and things of that nature. And right now, our HR person that we just hired, Elizabeth uh, Schiffler, is watching and she's been on several of the meetings. She just emailed me the um, John Beck's registration for PSATs, and it does say zero. Yeah. Not that I didn't doubt, I didn't doubt you, but it does say zero. So they may be taking it out of um, his, God, the refund. Yeah. Yes. But she she is has been a wonder, and I just wanted to acknowledge that. I appreciate that. I have to imagine it's coming out of the refund because right, and he was registered for the attending in person. Yeah. Okay. So any other uh, new business at this point? Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mr. Wigglesworth. Uh, would it be appropriate to um, continue the conversation here that um, Mr. O'Fever had started about the uh, fire apparatus um, and the cost? Yeah, that'd be a new business item, so go for it. Okay. So um, we had our... Uh, Penfield Area Fire Services Committee meeting um, last night. And one of the items that came up was the, um, the fire department, um, I guess the way that we're looking at it would contribute 10% of the cost of the apparatus and uh, we would pick up the rest. And this is just in draft form. And there was further discussion about some other items, but I think there's been a long brewing um, feeling from the fire departments um, that, you know, we're not supporting them to the level that we should be. And there's a dynamic there that I just think we should um, discuss, get out on the table, um, and, in, and it, in the end of the day, ensure them that we 100% want to support them. Um, and personally, I don't think they should have to contribute 10% towards the apparatus. The rub is that there's many, all three of them are sitting on certain amounts of money that they have saved up um, through one form of another. Um, and it somehow that there's got to be a meeting of the minds on what's an appropriate amount of savings for them to have 
for their individual organization. Um, and that's part of the conversation. And I think the second part of the conversation needs to be among our board that we're fully prepared to support um, and commit to the apparatus that, uh, that we feel is necessary to provide the service uh, to our constituents. I'm not sure I'm hearing you. I, I sort of thought you were saying we should fund 100% on apparatus, but then I'm also hearing that you're saying that because of resources and things that they should be supporting some of this. So I'm not sure. Well, temporarily, I mean, they have some funds right now that those funds will, you know, at some point become exhausted. Um, they're not able to raise the money that they were in the past. They have a significant amount of savings right now through um, being left money from estates and wills and that sort of thing. Um, I think we need to have like an understanding that, that we fully want to support their fire departments, that we don't want them out raising money or having to, to do fund drives or chicken pot pies, those types of things. We understand um, what they're doing and the service that they're providing for the township. At the same time, we have a conflict in good conscience. Um, while they're sitting on these sums of money, it's difficult for us um, to fully fund a piece of equipment without understanding exactly where and what they're gonna use those funds that they have saved up for. Agreed. Um, there is another dimension to this discussion. We have committed to the East Petersburg Fire Company an amount of $85,000 toward their apparatus schedule of replacement. And that does constitute about 10% of a new piece of apparatus. In fact, I believe it's targeted that way, if I remember correctly. And then we have the the, the question or the fact that they also in East Petersburg have their fire tax funding. So it's a, it's a complex matter. And when I saw that 10%, it caused me to wonder why or where that originated. And it's not that it originated in the house. It's something that Mr. Kottmeyer has known in his experience. And so um, the question is, is that going to be our position or do we need to consider something in a much larger picture? I agree completely that they should not have to be out doing potluck suppers and that kind of thing. They should spend their time training in that. Another element of that meeting last night that I think is appropriate to share is that I've had a feeling despite the tuition and the tax benefits were given to encourage the volunteerism that there should be other measures that we do as much as possible, even articles in the newsletter uh, illustrating a particular intern that's uh, in the process in the fire company or, or one that has 25 years of service or, or whatever, or if we get a new piece of apparatus that we give it some publicity to build that esprit de corps that is so important to the volunteer firemen if we go to paid firemen, we're gonna lose some volunteers because to them, their mantra is that they are volunteer firemen. That is the most important thing in, in their life in many cases, or at least second to their family maybe. Um, and I, I suggested maybe some t-shirts and I, I, I got some real rebuttal on that from one of the chiefs about that that was sort of a cheap shot <laughs> and I respect his opinion on it but then he also went to say that we're needing to go to fire, paid fire companies right away so we have a we have an attitude here that um, I just I think we can do more and whether it's insignificant things or whether it's significant things together they can maybe make a difference um, I just opened that up for, for other input and thoughts of how we can build that belonging attitude of our volunteer firemen. 
Chief, Chief Kottmeyer and I had a discussion this afternoon and um, he's with you, he, he understands, he fully understands. He understands that each, each fire company is different. Each fire company's needs are different. He also understands that there's a, a component to the township, also a component to the borough because they're different. Um, it's gonna take a, a level of trust and we have to build that trust. And I think that's what he's trying to do. And we just have to somewhat step back and allow him to do his work. And I think he can get it to happen. We might end up with a paid department, but like everyone has said, we want that out into the future as far as we can make it. And, and I think he can, he can bridge that uh, gap and keep us on a steady pace. Well, I would suggest, um, Mr. Wigglesworth and Mr. Lefebvre, you guys are light years ahead of the rest of the board. And kind of, I'll be honest with you, a little bit of what you were saying was at one point went over my head. Um, and I actually pay attention to this stuff. I would suggest that I, I do agree with the, uh, the baseline for finances. And I do agree we need to provide the maximum support that we can uh, for our fire companies. And there's nothing I disagree with what was said tonight. Uh, but I would encourage both of you maybe to have a working group meeting with Mr. Cotmore and just to start flushing some of these things out. And then maybe a little bit of a plan or something back to the full board uh, would be something that would be something that we can talk about and take some action on um, whatever it might be at this point, even if it's just kind of a policy of this board. So you know, we could do a resolution or something that lays out our policy or our direction to the the fire departments, whatever whatever we need to do uh, for the support that you guys would feel is necessary at this point. But I would encourage you guys to meet and to tackle both these issues um, and, uh, and, and as they, with staff come back with some recommendations. Yeah, we have the funding of a piece yeah. of apparatus for Hempfield, which is still on the table right now. And uh, is <clears throat> The chief caught my right. We also had that discussion as well. And, and the chief at Hemfield has is a bit lost at this point. They need the equipment, I but think we all are. Yeah. And we need to tie that together. And he's aware of that. And he'll, he'll, he'll bring things together. He'll do some presentations. He'll make with the public safety committee and bring everyone up to speed and then bring it to the, to the, to the supervisors. I mean, it's, it's to say I'm quite impressed with Mr. Kottmeyer at this point in time. It's, it's all valid concerns. I mean, we do have to have baselines. That was one of the reasons we brought on a fire official is to kind of start establishing the baseline, get some standardization between the three fire companies, um, help out with a lot of the administrative tasks that they're getting overwhelmed with. Those are all things we're looking to do. Um, so I would, I would just encourage the public safety working group to, to meet and come back with some things and have work with uh, Ms. Schweitzer. Maybe we do some resolutions, some policies, some recommendations for upcoming next year's budget uh, with finance and admin, tying that into it yep. um, and come up with a uh, holistic approach to our fire services. Unfortunately, it's never gonna be fast enough for them. We just need to show progress. They just wanna be known that they're being heard. Yes. And that's half the battle is that they're being heard and they're being listened to. I don't want to be too negative or get off on a negative tangent here, but you know, um, uh, Ed and and uh, Scott know much much more about this whole whole issue than, than I do. Um, but I would say, you know, I, I I'm a little concerned that that I hear that we're not in some way we're not supporting our fire departments or we're not supporting them enough. Um, there's this undercurrent that, that I feel when we get into these meetings. And that undercurrent develops because it always seems to be about the money. Where does the money, where does the money, are you, gonna, are you gonna do this or are you gonna do that? I've only been here three years, but I can't remember there's ever been a time when we haven't really supported the fire effort in this township. Uh, we support it financially. And we support it with two of our board members who work tirelessly in trying to bring this fire services organization together. We now have a, a, a chief fire commissioner. Um, 
who I think is exemplary, is exactly what we need at the time we need it. But, but I think, you know, I, you know, we have supported the, the, the fire companies and, and, I, and, I, and I, would, I would point this out and we have, and when they've needed something, we find that we have found a way to do it. It's sometimes it's taken a little bit from here, taken a little bit from there, but, but uh, again, um, you know, I'm concerned about the, the undercurrent. I think there need, you know, this is just, again, just my view. I think the top people in all these fire organizations need to be coming together and become more unified than we are. We, we, we have to break down this uh, uh, colloquial, you know, this, this, is my, this, this is what we're here, we're East Pete, we're Hemfield, and we're Roarstown. We are one organization, and I know it'll take some time to do, but uh, uh, I really think the sooner we can get down that road, the sooner we can deal with some of these other issues that are out there. And it's just, just some of my thinking on the situation. I'll, I'll echo your discussion with the point that we have never, ever, even with the 2008 and 2009 crisis, we have never cut public safety funding for police or fire as a way of balancing the budget. We've laid off staff, we've done other things, but we've never touched our public safety budget through good times and especially through bad times. Um, and every time there's been a request, we have met it and funded it. And we have, when you look at other municipalities, what the level that they fund fire services compared to us, we are exemplary with how the level of, of what we do. It really comes down to it's a communication issue and, and, the, and, and just listening and, and them listening to us and us listening to them. And the whole reason we brought on a fire official was to try and fill the void of the communication issue. And that's why I'm hopeful Will, will be occurring at this point. If you're willing, uh, Chief Kotmai would like to have a comment. No, I would certainly love to have him come on. Uh, good evening again. Uh, yeah, I just, again, um, you know, in discussing with the chiefs and we've had uh, meetings with the chiefs of the departments, uh, and as I commented earlier, you know, fire apparatus, one of the major expenses for, for any fire department. And I think the departments as a whole, even, even you know, you go back last year, <clears throat> fire department funding uh, from their perspective, any, any type of outside income sources because of COVID uh, greatly diminished. And I think there's a fear of that, you know, and what, what the future holds. Their funds are dwindling. Stations are getting a little older. They're costing a little more money to repair. Apparatus getting older costing a little bit more repair. I don't, and I don't want it to sound like anyone from any of the departments is saying that you are not giving. And I don't think that that is true. I think you are. And I think the budget and I think everything shows that, that you are committed to it. As, as Cindy alluded to, it, it, sometimes things don't happen fast enough. They don't have happen quickly enough. And, uh, you know, in the case of like out in Roarstown and things with the dwindling membership, they have few people doing a lot of things and it becomes overwhelming. And part of like when I say about like, you know, going to the fire chiefs and saying, what, what's one thing that I could take off your plate that would make make your life a little easier? And, and, you know, one of the things that we talked about was the apparatus, knowing that that type of stuff is going to be replaced. So there's funding for that. Uh, it also comes with, like Cindy said, in that trust, building that trust. Uh, they do have funds. And if, if they're going to ask the, the you know, the, the, the township for for funding, I also want to know that they're going to utilize their funds. To, to also offset some of the stuff at their station, whether it's repairs, updates, upgrades, whatever the case may be. Because, you know, as a 501c3, the funds that they get are still coming from taxpayers, from citizens. And the expectation is that the money is going to be used to maintain the fire department. So it doesn't matter whether it comes from the township or from others through a 501c3 and a fundraising event, it's still earmarked for the same thing. And, and you know, I just want to build a trust between both that, you know, hey, the township is here to help the expectation is also that the funds, you know, and, and, and the community would have that expectation is those funds that, that, that you collect through that fundraiser go to the fire department. The, the whole thing with the apparatus and, and the funding and, and like, for, for example, the Hempfield, 
uh, uh, fire apparatus. Uh, you know, they're looking at their overall picture with looking at, you know, what they have in their trust funds and everything. And there's some situations that occurred prior. We won't get into the details of that, but essentially it's not what it used to be. Uh, and, and they're looking at the future and, and repairs and things that they're doing to the station and otherwise. And they're, they're looking at the commitment to doing that as well as then how are they going to fund some of these other things. And it becomes a little overwhelming to a fire chief. The 10 percent down, you know, down payment that the fire departments, uh, you know, I don't think that that's uh, that's asking a lot. Uh, I think that that's something that, you know, we should at least ask. And and if we can pick up the remainder through a lease purchase program, I, I think that's kind of a win win situation. It's it's kind of it's killing, you know, two birds with one stone. We're, we're getting the commitment for the funds that they're receiving from from a fundraiser. Uh, and and we're also supporting them as we say we are, which which it would be, uh, you know, if there ever comes a time where they're not receiving any funds or it's like, you know, they really don't have anything. That's a different story. But I think there has to be some fiscal financial responsibility on, on their part as well, that the funds are actually being put back into. And I think they are. And I'm not saying they aren't. But there just has to be that trust built that, hey, we're using the funds that we get to do this. We need help from you for funds to do this. Um, and it's just, I, I, you know, the schedule that, that, that I came up with is simply to show an outline and it is just a draft and they're just numbers. But I wanted folks to see if you're a fire chief or if you're in charge of a department, this is what's staring you down almost on a monthly basis. And the older these apparatus get, they become maintenance intensive and they cost a lot of money. And, you know, a, a transmission or a pump goes out or in an aerial device, you have some major this it's it's a worry it's a constant worry and um you know i know that weighs on them heavily so when i asked that question about replacing the apparatus that was amazing to them that that we would work on something like that and try to work this out so that's sort of where that came from and and i'm hopeful that we can work to that we're working hard behind the scenes to try to get this, the whole Hempfield thing working. There's, you know, a little bit with the, with the bid specs and, and wanting to make sure that they're getting everything that they're asking for. Um, and, and then I'd like to, you know, in, in very short order, maybe at, at next month, come to you with a presentation and say, look, this is, this is what we have. This is what we'd like to do uh, as far as, you know, going forward to purchase their apparatus, because, if it's a 5% increase, I know it, it may not seem like much in the big picture, but even the financing alone, just looking at the lease option purchase and doing it that way versus the two separate loans and the 2% loan from the state, we can save probably about $100,000 per apparatus if we do the lease purchase. So over the period of many years and apparatus and replacing you know, several apparatus, that's, that's a few dollars to, to, to save in our pocket. So um, it's just, you know, thinking outside the box and doing some alternatives, looking at other choices and then making sure that we're getting what they need. That's going to do the job and, and is you know going to hold up over the years. And thank you. Thank you, John. Very well said. Thank you. Any more discussion on this new business I am at this point? I'll just add my two cents. I'm not an expert on this either. Um, I heard enough about Susquehanna Valley EMS's equipment. It sounded like it wasn't up to snuff. And you know, I have several thoughts on on this whole topic, but mainly, I think ten percent is not maybe a whole lot to ask. And I think it gives the fire company a goal to get a new piece of equipment to something to work towards. I think um, it makes sense that the older the equipment gets, the more maintenance it takes and so buying new equipment may actually save some money for the fire department so um it's a complex topic and i think we definitely support our our fire department and we want to keep doing that uh, have we ever considered a um like a subscription service or um, something of that nature everyone benefits from having the fire department it's kind of like insurance share the risk do we is the risk being shared did we like how much of the budget is made up by donations that would be something i'd be interested in um i mean the township supports the fire department township gets tax money so that may already be happening 
So I don't, like I said, I don't know a lot about it, but. I do like the, I appreciate that comment. I do like this suggestion from Mr. Wigglesworth, Mr. Kotmeyer, about us having a baseline with where the, the fire companies are at financially. Uh, remember when years ago, we had the rec center um, rec commission coming to East Hempfield looking for some assistance. And at that time, uh, the finance and admin committee asked them to open their books up. And it was eye opening at that point. And what happened is it led to a lot of good reform that has now put the Recreation Commission into a good spot. Uh, but had that funding request not come and had we not countered with before we turn over a lot of public money, we want to know where the funds were going. Uh, part of the request, uh, we wouldn't have the reforms that were in place today. I really would like to finally have an answer as to what our finances are for our fire companies. Really know the down and dirty of where strengths and weaknesses, where their where their budgets are at right now, and, and where they're at, and what their funding levels are, and what their their burn rate is going through their donations at this point, and how the donations came in for COVID. All these these financial numbers have really helped make a better picture at least for me personally, on what the finances look like for our three fire companies. Yeah, we had started to look at that. It's not complete. It's I, not I recognize that, yeah. But, yeah, but that yeah, would be yeah, nice. I mean, I look at what we did with the rec center and that was a good, that was painful at the time, but the the, the final result of what we got now with, with now um, new management running it and a new focus on things, it's, it's turned that operation around. Um, and it would just be good, for, I think, for, as part of this process, as we start talking about truck purchases and stuff like that, we should have a good handle on what the real finance, financial situations of the three fire companies are at this point. We're flying blind unless we know. So any more discussion on this one? Okay, well, that's what new business is for. <laughs> so there we go. We usually don't have a lot of it. You said uh, you had one, didn't you? I recovered mine. That was a PSATS thing. Oh, yeah. That okay. was at the very beginning. <laughs> All right. You want a commission report? Yeah, traffic commission report, Mr. Lefevre, please. Well, we earned our fee tonight. We spent the whole hour. And Mr. Stanley stole my thunder, though, by telling you that we approved the state road traffic signage plan. We uh, deferred to staff a management of reduced speed temporarily on the new section of State Road uh, during uh, the current period, at least until the final top coating is done and maybe evaluating then the status of the construction activity. So uh, that we're trying to induce and maintain some safety. Um, we're gonna do research on Embassy Drive where there's been a 25 mile an hour speed, no, I'm sorry, there's been a, yeah, there's been a 25 mile an hour. Possibly it should be increased, in, yeah, increased to 35. Lytle, we have a, a right turn only situation that's causing some potential traffic risks. And we're looking for Lytle's six month traffic report, which they owe us and see what that includes. Uh, speculating it may be to eliminate the right turn out on their Columbia Avenue gateway, but we will wait and see their report before taking any action. So uh, we had two residents of the Wheatland Avenue, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the voting district over there, uh, friendly, the friendly area that concerns speed on their streets, not unlike anywhere else in the township, but they asked us to look at things uh, and, and we asked them to see if they can get some plate numbers of some frequent violators that have been noticed by the residents and are difficult for our police to be able to find or see. So we're trying to deal with that with them and uh, showing interest in their concerns. 
That's the report for the Traffic Commission this evening. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Move on to uh, development services. Mr. Beck, if you can just give the highlights, please. Yes, sir. <clears throat> um, we have the official map um, moving forward. Planning Commission recommended adoption and that'll be coming to the board at the May 14th meeting or the second May meeting. The staff has sent the building identification signs to the County Planning Commission. Uh, the Township Planning Commission uh, recommended approval and that will be coming before the board at the May 5th meeting. Uh, the State Road Commerce Park final plot, revised final plan was recorded this week. <clears throat> 701 Stony Battery Road, I just received a report tonight that uh, their project is ahead of schedule and they will be recording the plan within the next week or two and moving forward with um, getting the building permit application. Nothing new for 791 Stony Battery Road. Traditions of America, um, their phase three final plan was received two weeks ago and it seems that their plan um, was done pretty well and it will move, be moving to the planning commission uh, for the May uh, 12th planning commission meeting and subsequently to the board. The Nolt Road cluster development uh, project is scheduled for the May 5th board meeting for review and conditional approval. <clears throat> And just to make the board aware, we have received, staff has received um, a few emails and a few calls from residents in the uh, near Genoese Drive that live on North Donnerville Road concerned about the Ironstone Building Materials Project. Um, I put them in contact with the engineer and I haven't heard anything back at this point. Uh, that concludes my report. Thank you. Any questions? I could just make one comment on the 2260 Dairy Road billboard conditional use hearing, uh, zoning hearing where the zoning hearing board approved the two uh, uh, conditions for the placement of that billboard. I, I would hope that both conditions could make their way into the new sign ordinance that we're, we're planning to review. Those two conditions were that the height of the billboard wouldn't be any higher than a close building, number one, and then number two, the change of message uh, agreed to by the uh, owner was uh, 20 seconds per before it changes, dwell time, whatever whatever that's called. So I would I ask that you take a look at that uh, when we get to the, the changes. Thank you. Okay, any more questions for Mr. Beck? I have one, the, um, the official map, um, could you just explain that a little, little more, what that is? Yes, sir. Um, the East Hempfield Township official map is um, a combination of <clears throat> four different maps. The first one being um, a map that addresses parks and trails. Well, I'm sorry, parks, trails, and open space. A second map uh, addressing roads and transportation. And a third map addressing stormwater management projects or stormwater management improvements. The fourth map is the uh, combination of all three of those maps put in together. Um, the steering committee thought it would be a good idea to keep those three plans separate to make it more legible or easier to read for people when they're looking at those plans. Um, this is the final planning tool that East Hempfield has to adopt. This will work in conjunction with the uh, comprehensive plan, the zoning ordinance, the subdivision land development ordinance, the stormwater management ordinance, the street and sidewalk ordinance, and will become a um, tool for the, plan, for the township to negotiate with um, developers and property owners um, in the future. It will also help the township um, as a tool to secure grant funding for future projects such as stormwater management or for um, subsequent road projects that may come down the road where um, an official map that's adopted by the township can be used to show that the township has 
an adopted plan of action for whatever yeah. that grant application may be for. Thank you, Mr. Beck. The reason I ask that is I've been thinking about something um, for a little while now regarding uh, township owned property. Um, I don't know that it needs to be part of this, but I thought it would be good for discussion for the board at some point. Um, portion of the golf course is zoned residential. It is my view that the current board would never um, allow that property to become um, resident un units or be developed. Um, and I think it's something that perhaps we should look at to get the zoning in line with the rest of the property that the township owns there. Um, I don't know if anyone else on the board has thoughts on that. I'm the only board member that's still on the board the last time the township tried to sell that property. And I have no issues whatsoever for us not to go through that process again. So what property are you talking about? The, the Nisley road track of the golf course. When we took the house down. Yeah, that was at one point the uh, when I was first on the board, I think it was 2010, 2011, somewhere in that range. Mm -hmm. There was a desire at that point to sell the to put the property up for sale and um, that did not get warmly received at the time um, and subsequently what that led was ultimately led to us forming the recreation uh, commission and the authority that we have now and and rerunning our golf course operations uh, but it took a roundabout way to get there so that one thing actually caused the other at this point um, I've stated many times, I think that that would be a great location someday for a centralized facility for fire services. If we ever were down the road to consolidate our fire services, that location is dead center in the township and gives immediate access north, south, east, west to our uh, two interchanges and to Marietta and Columbia and to Harrisburg Pike. It's an outstanding location. Um, and that would only take up about two acres of that 22 acres, 24 acres, however many acres that is. So I'd, given the perspective of a lot of the residents, the fact that we really don't need to develop it, um, we don't need the money right now, um, I'd be in favor of uh, kind of memorializing that position. Unless somebody would like to go through a lot of public hearings, making the case for selling it. So are we looking for a resolution that we're gonna, we're not going to? Well, I think that's just Mr. Wigglesworth is just throwing it out there. There's a lot of steps. That'd be a rezoning. We'd have to actually change the map if we went down that road. I was thinking maybe start with the planning group with, it's currently zoned residential, and I don't think it, my opinion is we're all going to be off of this board at some point, and I think it's our will. Um, that that land not be used as residential um, or turned into um, residential property. So whether it's done by deed restriction, whether it's done by resolution, whether it's a rezoning to fit with what else the golf course is currently zoned as. Um, you know, I just, I think, I don't think we should have it there zoned residential when it's never gonna be residential, I guess is what I'm getting at. I want that to be part of my vision for Four Seasons is with uh, some recreational things, some ski slopes, some tubing slopes, maybe. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of potential there in that area. That would definitely be a challenging course to try and make a putt, that's for sure. <laughs> I, have, I can't make a putt on level ground, let alone a slope. We also do have a big picture at, at some point, too, about the... Uh, the stormwater facility that we were talking about putting there to address the uh, Swar Run flooding that starts in on Church Street and then continues down into Mill Creek development and then continues all the way down the Bowman Road. Um, that's the headwaters and the best way to address the flood. The upstream flooding is to address the upstream headwaters. Uh, so that's something that site can do too at some point. 
Okay, that, that's I'm glad you brought that up. Any more discussions at this point? Um, I think if everybody's okay, we would take that up with the planning group unless there's any issues at this point. Okay. So Ms. Schweitzer, manager's report. So in brief, um, jumping to Farmingdale Road, we were fortunate enough to get a grant from the MTF of uh, $993,000, which is what we asked for. So that's going to go to uh, support that whole long-term initiative. The downside of getting that grant is there's paperwork. So we can't do anything until that paperwork is in place and we're dealing with PennDOT. So it's going to be probably a summer project as opposed to an April project or early spring. Uh, but we are moving forward. We are moving forward with the rights away, um, trying to get those accomplished as well. Four Seasons Blue Collar, the, as I indicated earlier, Max Snack Bar is open and operating. It has a fairly extensive menu. If you haven't been there yet, definitely give it a try. It definitely has different options open and available and uh, worthy of a stop. The library, I was approached by two ladies from the neighborhood. They are interested in creating a little lot, lot lending library uh, located for at the entrance to Ayer Park, which is a great idea. You had gotten a copy of their letter. I'll be working with, with them to uh, figure out an appropriate location for that. You solved the mystery for me. For some time, I've noticed what's an oversized birdhouse on a post at East Petersburg Mennonite Church. That's right along is. the sidewalk along Main Street. Mm -hmm. This evening, passing there, there was a young family and they were getting a book out of it. Mm -hmm. So it's one of these library things. And I would suggest that if they, if we are going to allow them, and I think it's a good thing to allow, that they should be allowed to be inside the covered bridge so they have some more weather protection for their facility. I, I did suggest that, but they want it to be obvious too that not necessarily maybe some of the soccer players or some of the parents watching soccer okay. wouldn't go through the, the covered bridge so they're, they're we're going to look at it yeah the, the, they have one in lids uh, and it's actually almost looks like a soda cooler it's got a clear glass on the one side so you can see the books okay and you open it up and you take a book out you put another book mm -hmm. in its place and it's kind of like a book swap mm -hmm. um and there couldn't it's, be it's too seen, many books in the one at petersburg but yeah, this one, this one was about the size of a, a soda machine oh, okay. and, and, and okay. had a door on the front of it. And wow. it was, a, it was called a little library and you could, you can look through the window and you can see all the books that were there. And I guess if one struck your fancy, you would open it up. It was not locked. Um, and one, you could pull something out. One right up to Atlanta's farm. Yes. At, at their pavilion. Yes. That's, it's a growing trend. The idea is you're supposed to take a book, leave a book. Everywhere. Yeah. Uh, more good news. The PIB loan that we had uh, taken out in 2011 for $2.4 million has been paid off as of January. Joe Robinson got the paperwork uh, a few days ago. That was originally used for repairs to Nisley Road, the basin repair for the Township Roadways that year, engineering and construction of the pole barn, the salt shed and guide rail and repairs and replacements. So that, that PIB loan has been paid. That was a 2% loan. You have a copy of, of the reports or the group reports and some meetings that I attended. At the very bottom there, you see Chantel, which is a new internet provider that has approached us for a franchise agreement. I have the documentation that I'm looking at now. Our attorney uh, from the Cohen Law Group has also looked at it. That will be before you probably at your um, May 5th meeting. They will do a presentation for you. They want the whole township? They will start with uh, two hubs and branch out. The difference between the Comcast franchise and this one will be that there's no guarantee that they'll cover every area. They will make every attempt, but they won't commit to, make, to covering every area. They're going to start in uh, Roarstown and Landisville and then fill in and around. We get a stipend every year from Comcast, do we not? Yes, 5% of their, their uh, revenues, limited revenues. And that will be the same for this one. These folks will do similar? Yes, now the, the, it's not free money because Chantel's, Comcast customers will go to Chantel, 
which will lower Comcast. So it's going to be about the same in terms of revenue to the township, but it will give another option to residents. And realistically, it's not free money because we're all paying for it. But true, that's I mean, true. They, they don't pay a cent of it. They pass that, that, that franchise fee on to all the customers. They do. Um, but I, I agree, it'll probably be more of a wash at this point, you know, because if Chantel came into my neighborhood, you know, they would have a lot of Comcast customers that would probably jump ship. I can't hmm. see, I mean, that's the only way to get internet. So it's going to be either Chantel or Comcast, and pretty much all the homes are wired for internet at this point. So we don't, we're gonna, most of us don't have, most of the older communities don't have that as an option. Let's get it through your telephone line. Not, not the uh, fiber stuff, not the good no, stuff. Not that, that's no, what I'm Fios. saying. Not this fast stuff yeah. that can, Fios, that, that can uh, actually deliver to Comcast speeds. Now the difference between Comcast and Chantel is that, uh, as they, they will explain, but the download speeds are incredibly fast, much fast. The upload speeds are much faster than Comcast, which is their selling point, particularly if you're working from home. Are they actually fiber versus copper like Comcast? Is? They are fiber. That would be nice. Yeah. It's good for Comcast to have some competition. By it way. is, isn't it? They don't have the band. It's they don't have the bandwidth to support either. So that's that's just a good thing. Their, their copper lines have started to get to capacity. So that's the end of my report, unless there's questions. Uh, any questions for Ms. Schweitzer? Nope. Okay, we will now open up to public comment. Is there anybody here that's offering public comment? There's nobody left in the room. So, Ms. Garber, is there anybody there? And I see you shaking your head now. So, with no public comment, it is now, uh, it looks like 928, and we will adjourn the meeting. Thank you.